The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit wogcc.com. We are going to continue on in our Life App series that we kicked off last week. And the title of my message, if you're a note taker, which I hope you are, is Real Friends, Real Connections. You can write that down, Real Friends, Real Connections. We've been going through this series talking about different life applications that we see throughout Scripture because God cares about our everyday lives. Sometimes we only think God cares about the big moments, and so therefore we only want to involve God in the big moments. But God cares about every aspect of our lives, and God wants our lives to glorify Him, and He wants our lives to be something that's a reflection of Him as we are His hands and feet here in the earth for His glory. So with that being said, real friends, real connections. Do you have any real friends? Real friends, do you have any real connections? I'm not talking about just people that you say hi and hello to. I mean real friends, real connections. Sometimes we think that we do, and sometimes we feel very alone. I did a little bit of research in preparation for this message by looking up some studies, and I found this study that's called Dunbar's Number which is a number that really deals with the relational capacities and experiences that we all have as human beings. And this is what Dunbar came up with as his standard for measuring relational connection. He said this, most people can name about 1,500 names associated with different faces. So they can connect the dots between about 1,500 names and face now, I found that really interesting because aren't we the worst at saying stuff like, I'm really good with faces, not so much with names. I know I've said that with people. I know you've probably said that on certain occasions. And it's normally when we're wanting to give ourselves an out for not remembering somebody's name. But the interesting thing is I dug a little deeper into this whole name-face association, why we don't remember names. And there's two primary reasons that we don't remember people's names. Are you ready for this? The first one is because we don't really see any need for furthering the connection. In other words, we don't care. All right? That's the plain and simple version, is that we just don't care to remember the person's name because we may think, I'm at this event, or I'm at this conference, or I'm at the grocery store, or I may be at this restaurant. I'm never going to meet this person again, and so therefore, I don't try to remember their name, so I just don't care. But the other reason, which I think the more significant reason we don't remember people's names, is because when we are interacting with someone for the first time and they give us their name... Studies have shown that we are so focused on our own programming and on our own um, response to them that we're not even paying attention. It's not that we may not care. It's that we have have pre-programmed ourselves and pre-wired ourselves to automatically think about how we're going to respond. So someone says, hi, how are you doing? And you're thinking about, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? Okay, they're wearing a Packer jersey. I'll talk about the Packers. It's cold outside. I'll talk about the fact that it's cold. Okay, what do I say next? And we're so focused on our own script that we don't pay attention to what the other person's saying. That's why you can say hello to someone, they introduce themselves, five minutes later you walk away and you go, what was that guy's name again? Because we get so focused on ourselves and we're not slowing down and really paying attention. So we can put a name to 1,500 faces. That's kind of our capacity. Then they drill this down a little further. They say that we will have about a group of 500 or so acquaintances that we can maintain healthy relationships uh, with about 150 people, that's family members included. 150 healthy relationships is about what we can maintain. We can have about 50 close relationships and that we can have about 15 intimate friendships and about three to five really close, deep, personal confidants, really deep friendships in our lifetime. So how are we doing as a society on this? I did a little bit more research and I looked into probably the most popular method of connection in our day and time or what we think is connection, which really is pseudo connection. It's a false connection, Facebook. We think we're connected on Facebook. We think we have real friends. We think we have real connections because we can look and see the number of friends that we have on Facebook. So here's the data from the most recent study and survey done on Facebook. The average Facebook user 
has 338 friends, but can only depend on about four of them during a crisis. Isn't that wild? Can only depend about four of them. And as you think about that, you think about the people you would actually depend on that would be there, whether they're asked or not. They just check on you. They just care about you. You look at the 338 on average. The average person says that there's about four people out of that whole group that they can actually depend on in a consistent way to be there for them. The younger Facebook crowd has more uh, virtual friends and fewer face-to-face -face friends. The older crowd of Facebook users has more personal uh, face-to-face friends and less online digital friends. And I think that this just shows us these trends and this hunger of this deepening connection in our society and in our world. Connection with other people helps us to draw a line between simply enduring life and really enjoying life. Because isolation, as I've mentioned many times before, is one of the biggest traps and one of the biggest tricks that the enemy would want to use against us. So many people live in isolation. And we understand that we cannot grow in the full potential that God has for us simply by ourselves. We see in Scripture that we weren't meant to just do this journey alone. Over and over again, repeatedly in Scripture, we are told to spur one another on to good works. We're told to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're told to serve one another, to care for one another, to exhort one another. We're told over and over again in Scripture to do things for one another. As a matter of fact, if you count up the one another's in Scripture, you will see that over 58 times that the, word, the phrasing one another is used in a way that would give us instruction to do something to serve or to love or to care relationally about another person. There are 58 one another commands about the way that we are to treat one another. So other people, they sharpen us. They hold us accountable. They help us reach our goals. They help us grow. And we each have the capacity for connection. So you've got to get past that lie that the enemy would want to get you to buy in that no one wants to be around you. Everybody has the capacity for connection. Everybody has the capacity to be connected at some level to someone. So how do we do this? How do we get real friends? And how do we make real connections? So here is the main takeaway from today, and I want you to write this down. Having real friends is an investment that you make, and it's a responsibility you take. Having real friends is an investment you make and a responsibility that you take. So many people are waiting for people to come up to them and invest in them and make them their friends. It's almost like they're sitting in a chair and they have a stack of applications sitting next to them wondering why no one is coming and taking the applications to come be their friend. Why is no one connecting with me? Why is no one wanting to be? I have all of these applications here. Just come and grab one, and we'll see if you fit the bill. No, that's not how this thing works. And Scripture lays this out really plainly in Proverbs 18 and 24. The New King James Version says it like this. A man who has, who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, when we look at these passages of Scripture where there may be something just in a, a phrase or a thought or a paragraph or a sentence where we have an English translation of multiple words being used in the same kind of sentence or paragraph, it would always do you some due diligence as a person that would study Scripture to go and to look up the meanings of those words because often our English language is limited to being able to describe certain ideas or phrases, and the people who were actually doing the translation of this from the Hebrew or the Aramaic or the Greek, they're looking at those words and trying to find the closest word to help express what this actually means. And in this particular passage of Scripture, in the New King James Version, you see that they use the word friend multiple times. Now, that is an indicator that there's something else going on. So as we look at that scripture and we look at the word friends, we see the first phrase says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. Now we see that word friend, as you look in the Hebrew text, that word friend actually is the Hebrew word reah, R-A-Y-A. -A. And that word means neighbor, 
companion, buddy, your friend, your Rhea, you know, you're hanging out with your friend, your buddy. But then you see there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, in the second half of that scripture, the word friend is not the word Rhea. It's not a Rhea who sticks closer than a brother. It's the word that is used there called Aheb, A-H-E-B. If you want to say it uh, like, a, like a Jew, you would say Aheb. And so, you know, that's probably terrible, you know, but that's how, you know, they would say it with the little ch sound. The word Aheb is the word that means covenant partner. It means a deep, intimate relationship. It's the same word used in Scripture where Abraham was called a friend of God. Abraham was not called a Rhea of God. It wasn't like Abraham was God's buddy. It was, this is my covenant partner. This is a deep, intimate, close relationship. A man who has Rhea or buddies or neighbors or companions, yeah, he himself must be friendly. But then there's a, an Aheb, a closer, intimate covenant partner that sticks closer than a brother. And I began to examine that scripture and think about this idea of a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I don't know if you have a brother or not, and I don't know if you're friends with him or not, but if you do have a brother and you are friends with him, your brother was kind of given to you. <laughs> you know, he kind of like said, here's your brother, now go play nice, go be friends because this is your brother. And it's someone who is connected to you because of family, because of blood. There's a connection there. But an Aheb sticks closer than that family. Why? Because they chose to get that close to you. It wasn't someone who had a direct connection by some sort of family identity. No, this person became family because of a choice, because of an investment, because someone made an investment to develop this deep intimate relationship with this person, and they took responsibility to have that kind of a deep relationship that was going to be closer than even a blood relative. You see, people like this, these real deep intimate friendships, they aren't just in the relationship for what they can get out of it. They're not just involved for what you can gain them access to or what doors you can open for them or how special that necessarily you make them feel or they make you feel. No, you're in it because you genuinely care. You're there when things are going great. You're there when things aren't going great. You're there when you get along and when you're disagreeing. That type of friend, that deep relationship, that real connection is going to truly help us grow. And a have friend, a deep friend, an intimate friend is going to be someone that shows up whether they're needed or not. You can get a lot of acquaintances to show up when there's a need if you make a big enough ask and people feel obligated enough to come help you. But a deep, close, real friend will be there whether they're needed or not. They just don't show up when there's a crisis, they show up just for the heck of it because they love you, because they care about you, because they're for you. They celebrate with you. They weep with you. They encourage you. They may even at times disagree with you, but you still can connect and still have that relationship because you have made an investment. To have real friends, to make real connections, you have to invest. You have to take responsibility. So there's a few things we've got to learn. There's some things we have to do if we want to have those types of relationships so we can truly grow. So one of the things I want you to do, one of the things we all need to do, one of the things I want you to write down is be the type of friend that you want to attract. So many times we want to be around certain people, but I think that we attract more times than not who we are, not who we want to be. Now that will preach really good. You see, we have to be the type of friend that we want to attract. We, if you're only interested in yourself, you're probably only going to attract people at a surface level who are only interested in themselves. And so if you have all these people you're surrounded by, you say, man, my friends are so selfish. You're going to attract who you are. Oh, I, I, my, my friends, they, they, they're, they're, they're this way or that way, and we always want to blame our friends for all the things in our life that aren't going right or blame other people. Where Listen, if we want loyal friends, what do you think we have to be? Loyal. If we want dependable friends, who do you think we have to be? We need to be dependable. If we want honest friends, who do you think we have to be? We have to be honest people. 
You see, we need to be the type of friend that we want to attract. Oh, all you single guys and single gals out there, you better listen to me really good. Be the type of person that you want to attract and hang out around places and with people that are those types of people. Don't go out looking for a project thinking you're going to help them. Hello, somebody. Just because they look cute. And next thing you know, you've got a lot of problems on your hand. You need to be the type of person, be the type of friend, be the type of spouse. Even if you're not married, be that type of person that you want to attract. You see, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul said, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of other people. So in other words, I'm not just interested in myself. I'm actually thinking about other people and putting them ahead of myself. I don't wait for everyone to come and engage me and, and come talk to me. I want to take the initiative and be that type of person that's welcome, uh, welcoming, that's friendly, that, that's open, that, that's honest, that's caring, that's genuine, because those are the type of people that I want to attract in my life. So I have to set the standard and be that type of person. So I have to take responsibility to grow. I have to take responsibility to make sure that I'm engaging in the right places and around the right people that I want to engage with and attract and grow together with and have those real connections and those real friends. And that takes time because the next thing we have to do is invest time in relationships. We've got to invest the time. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight. We have to invest the time in relationships. If you have your Bible, go over to Romans chapter 12. We'll read a portion of Scripture here. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romans 12 and verse 10. We're going to read through verse 16. Romans 12, 10 through 16 says this. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Stop right there. Outdo one another in showing honor. Listen, too many people get into relationships with people that they're simply competing with. They're trying to outdo one another in the wrong things. They're trying to outdo one another in who has the best lawn, who has the biggest car, who has the nicest house, who has the biggest flat screen TV, who has the most friends on Facebook, who got the most likes on their post, who has the best office at the, in the company. All these different silly things that we compete with people and we feel like we have an edge or a leg up on someone because of what we have compared to what they don't have or how people treat us compared to how they may treat or talk to them. And we're always competing with other people. Listen, real friends are not going to to compete with each other. They're going to see, how can I outdo one another if I'm going to outdo them? It's going to be in the way that I honor them and love them and care about them. That's a real friend. If I'm going to outdo you in something, it's not going to be in petty foolishness. It's instead going to be in loving you and showing you respect and showing you honor. And that's what Paul is trying to say to the Romans here. He's saying, if you're going to outdo one another, do it by showing honor. Verse 11, do not be lazy or slothful in your zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. I can't remember which translation it is, but one of them says, don't think too highly of your own opinion." You know, we want to invest in relationship and we want to be the type of person that we want to attract. So we don't need to think too highly of our opinion. When we think too highly of our opinion, sometimes people just don't want to be around us because we're always thinking way too highly of our opinion and always causing an awkward conversation or an awkward situation. Right? And sometimes people just love to stir the pot and they love to stir up trouble. I love to share how they're right and everyone else is wrong. If you're going to invest time in a relationship, it's not just time, but it's the quality and the type of time that you're investing in the relationship. What type of time are you investing? Are you investing where you're looking to outdo your friend, not in what they have and what you have, 
but instead rather in how you love, respect, and show them honor and care about them? Or are you investing not in your own opinion so they'll see how smart and wise and and awesome that you are, but instead you're looking for ways to serve them? If they're weeping, you're right there with them weeping. If they're rejoicing, you're right there with them rejoicing. That's the type of time we need to invest in relationship where Paul also says we're constant in prayer, where we're praying for other people, where we're putting others' needs ahead of ourselves, where we're actually investing and caring about other people and not just what we can get from people. You see, we have to stop waiting for people to be our friend, and we, start, we need to start showing them how. We need to start showing them how. Stop waiting for people to be your friend. Start showing them how. If if you don't show up and you're always fickle and not dependable, how can you ever have close friendships? You know, showing up is a big part of investing in relationships. Amen? Investing in relationships is showing up, man. It's being there. You know, how can we ever help one another grow? if we're not dependable and we don't show up. I think the greatest ability that we can have is dependability. That we can be dependable, that people can count us, that they know that we care, that it's not just words, that it's not just fluff, but that there's action to back it up. Not that I'm always able to cater to you and do everything that you, that you want me to do, but that you know that if you ever needed that person, that that person is there for you. They're dependable. You can count on them. They care about you at a deep level. That's the type of relationship that's going to help us grow. Over in the book of James, in the first chapter, James chapter 1, I love this text here. James 1 and verse 19 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. A healthy investment in friendship is going to be listening. I know that the best listener on planet earth right now that I know, and a lot of you know him too, is Pastor Andy Shanholtz. If you know Pastor Andy Shanholtz, he is the best listener. He is absolutely phenomenal at it. I don't know how he does it. He blows me away with how he just welcomes you in and listens, And because I can talk a lot. <laughs> and he can listen a lot. That's why we work so well together. That's why we're still such great friends today. Matter of fact, just a couple weeks ago, he drove 45 minutes just to come to my house to help show me how to close up my pool for the winter. I've never had a swimming pool before. We just moved, and this house had one of those stand-up pools, and I had no idea how on earth I was going to you know, do this. And, and, and I was like watching YouTube videos, and he said, I'll come over and help you. And he comes over, and he shows me what to do, and he's so patient. He's like, you do this, you do that. And then afterwards, we're just sitting down. He's like, so how's Holly? How's your kids? How's, I mean, and I'm just talking, 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 and I'm like, I haven't asked him about Gene. I haven't asked him about Courtney or Nick or, you know, and so how's your, I have, because I got so wrapped up because he's such a good listener. I got lost in talking. He's so good at it. But as I think about that, I think, man, I want to be that way. I want to be that person that can just welcome people in and let them know, hey, what you're saying matters to me. And you want to know how you can do this? You want to know how to invite people in and be a good listener? And I'm learning this and I'm getting better at it. I'm not an expert at it but I'm working at trying to get better at it. When people begin to share things with you, ask questions. How simple is this, right? How simple is this? Instead of you just talking and talking and talking, if someone's starting to share something with you, ask a question about it. You know, there was a guy that he and I were probably the most unlikely of friends that now I'm actually becoming really good friends with. An older gentleman in his mid-60s and I became very good friends at a wedding that I performed. He and I had never met previously. He does not attend church here, but he's the father of the groom that uh, I was performing the wedding for. And I'm at the wedding rehearsal, and I don't know anybody there except the bride and groom. And I don't know how many weddings you guys have performed, but sometimes that's really weird. (laughs) When you're at a wedding and you don't know anyone except the bride and groom, and you can't monopolize their time because it's not about you, so you're just kind of there. And sometimes it's weird. So you have to depend on your natural charisma and charm to go and make friends with people. You know what? I was kind of lost that day, to be honest with you. I, I had already done, went through the rehearsal time, and I see the father of the groom 
sitting at a table by himself, and he's writing some stuff down. And I thought, there's my chance. There's somebody who's by themselves that no one's talking to. And I went over and I sat by this guy. And I sat down with him and I just, you know, talked to him for a minute. You know, obviously we were talking about the wedding. Oh, it's going to be so pretty. It's going to be so great. It's a beautiful venue. It's going to be great, you know, small talk. And then I began to ask, so what do you do for a living? He said, well, I'm a retired school teacher. And I said, oh, what are you doing with your time now since you've retired? He says, well, I'm really into making wood bowls. I turn wood on this giant lathe that I had, and I, and I make wooden bowls. And I, I sell them in Door County. I have uh, some art pieces set up at the, uh, at, at the Kohler Art Center. He said, I've just really done some, you know, really neat things, and here's some of my work. He showed me pictures on his phone, and we started talking about all this woodwork. I'm going, this is great, and I'm asking questions. I began to ask questions about it. What's the process? Like, how long does it take? It takes a long time to make a wooden bowl, in case you didn't know. And then he looked at me, and he says, you want to make one? Sure. <laughs> Let's do it. He said, well, what are you doing next week? And I said, nothing. I guess making a wood bowl. He said, great. Well, here's my address. He lives in Batavia. Went over there and went to his house, and we started making wood bowls and plates. And me and this guy have been friends for two, three months now, and I never would have thought I would be making pieces of, of wood art and wood bowls and plates and cups and stuff with this guy. That, that would have never been on my radar. But, you know, I took advantage of an opportunity to be interested in someone and ask questions. And now I've got a buddy that we make, you know, wooden plates and bowls with. And it's awesome. And they're beautiful pieces. He does some incredible work. It's really cool stuff. I, I'm not a woodworker. I'm not a handy guy. You know, ask my wife <laughs> or Pastor Keith. He'll know too. You know, he has to fix most of my stuff. But I'm learning a, a, a new skill and having fun with this guy because I did what? Because I asked questions, because I invested in relationship. I invested in spending time with someone. I just had to take the initiative and I asked questions and, and I'm trying to get better at listening, but that's how you're, you're going to grow is investing that kind of time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that happens always in an instant, but it's an investment that you make and we got to be quick to listen slow to speak and just talk about ourselves, but quick rather to listen. I think listening is the most important skill that you could have in building a friendship. And then the next thing we need to do is we've got to invest in earning trust. Trust is not freely given, we know that, especially the more that people have been burned by other people they've allowed to get close to them. When you've allowed people to get in close and there were people that you were supposed to trust, that you were told you could trust, and there's people maybe that you trusted too soon or whatever the case may be, and they violated that trust in whatever manner that they did, you got to earn that. People are at different stages in life, and you've you got to invest. So you've got to be consistent. You've got to be reliable. You've got to be loyal. You've got to keep confidences. Oh, my goodness. This is huge. You've got to keep confidences. When someone shares their heart with you, you have to keep confidences. You can't betray when someone is opening their heart to you and sharing uh, their heart with you, and then you go out and share it with everyone else. If you don't have close friends and you gossip about people, that's probably why. Don't shout me down. I'm preaching good. <laughs> if you're gossiping and always running people down, sharing their secrets, and you're like, well, why don't I have any close friends? Well, that's probably why. Listen, you've got to invest in that trust. And when people share their heart with you, you you've, you've got to keep those things that they share with you in confidence. In confidence, build that trust. Another thing is that we can't have these consumer-type relationships where we are, act as consumers and we view ourselves as consumers and we're only interested in what we can get from the other person. And it's a one-way exchange. I remember when I was a little kid, I lived out in the country and all of my friends, it seemed like, had four-wheelers, except for my family. We didn't have a four-wheeler. And I would make friends with kids that had four-wheelers in hopes that I could use their four-wheelers, but I really didn't care about being their friend. The kid was probably younger than me. I probably didn't like the same kind of stuff they liked, but they had a four-wheeler. And I wanted to use the four-wheeler, so I became friends with them because of what I wanted to use that they had. There's a lot of people that still do that even as adults. We have friendships with people because we think they're going to get us somewhere. We're going to ride their coattails, or we just want to rub shoulders with the people they rub shoulders with, or we just want to be made to feel special by being in certain environments, and it's a one-way street. 
And sometimes we connect with people because of what they're for. We become acquaintances with them because we're for what they're for. Sometimes we connect with people because we're against what they're against and we like are fighting for a cause with them. But when the cause is over, we're no longer friends. We were comrades in that. Or maybe we were acquaintances or constituents when it was something that we were for. But we never really go deep and have those deep, close, intimate relationships. And it's okay to have those relationships because you're not going to have deep relationships, deep, intimate friendship with everybody. Sometimes you're just connected with people because we're all for the same thing or we're all against the same thing. There'll be countries that will unite and go to war together because they're against the same enemy. But once the war is won and it's over, everybody goes back to doing their thing. They all don't just stay there and stay huddled up and keep hugging and you know, invest in this deep friendship. We were there for each other during this time. We had a common goal. But there are people in your life that will be that. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that when one person in the friendship or in the relationship mistakes someone in their life that they thought was a close confidant, but they were only that comrade that was against what they were against or that was for what they were for. And then if someone serves their agenda better or if the common purpose is no longer shared, then the friendship ends and we get all upset because we thought it was this big, deep friendship and we thought this was a lifelong thing. And it was just a season in your life. Listen to me. This is going to help you today. There are some friendships and relationships in your life that God sends your way just for a season to help you get somewhere that he's trying to get you. And when it's time for those people to move on, you need to let them move on instead of getting swollen up and mad at them because they're not still with you. Hello, somebody. Not everybody's meant to go with you. Maybe they were walking with you for a season, and that's okay. Appreciate that season. Cherish that season. Be grateful and thankful for that season. But if you try to hang on to people just because you think you need them in your life and you have to have them, you're probably wearing them out and you're probably getting wore out and y'all are frustrated at each other, but you're trying to hang on to something that it's time to move on. And you need to invest in those friendships that are the ones that are the real connections, the real relationships, those lifelong things. And you're going to have very few of those a lot fewer than you will have people that will be for what you're for and against what you're against. But if you want those real connections, you need to keep investing in those. And then when you have those seasonal relationships, let them be seasonal. It's okay. It's okay to let those relationships be seasonal. You can't think that everyone that comes into your life is going to end up being your close confidant and your best friend. Not everyone is going to do that. There will be those that do, and those that do, Keep them extremely close in your life. But when it's time for those that aren't to move on, let them move on. It'll be good for you and for them. You know, my absolute best friend that I ever have had outside of my wife and probably will ever have is Pastor Keith. Pastor Keith and I have been together since I was 18 years old. He was 16 years old. I became his youth pastor at 18. All right? So here I am two weeks out of high school and I become the youth pastor of this little youth group. This church hired me. They, like, paid me, okay? (laughs) I wasn't looking for the job. The job found me. I was sacking groceries, and a guy comes out and basically hands me a card, gives me a number to call, and I'm like, okay, and tells me that he feels like I could be a great youth pastor from a conversation carrying out his groceries, and that's what got me started being in full-time ministry, and I've been a, a pastor in some shape or form since then. And I was a youth pastor there at this little church, and that's where I met my wife. It's where I met Pastor Keith, eventually met um, Pastor Stephen, although he was at another church. Um, And I look back at my relationship with Keith, and we've been through a lot together. And as I was doing this message and putting it together, I kept going back and revisiting times that he and I have had highs and lows, and we've had our our, our good times and we've had our bad times. Um, and he's always been there, and he's always stuck with me. And, and you know, I, I told him when I was putting this message together on Tuesday, when I finally finished it, um, I found him walking around here in the church, and I went up to him, and I said, hey, man, I'm real emotional right now. And, and I told him, I said, uh, I, I'm probably going to hug you, you know. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, he absolutely loves to be hugged. He just loves a warm, <laughs> long, warm embrace, long, warm hugs. He's like Olaf. He just... He really loves them. And, you know, I think about the things that I've been through with with him in his life. And, you know, he stood in my wedding. I stood in his wedding. Um, uh, We we started a church together in Texas. And when we started a church, this is really special to me, 
Because when we started this church, there were people who was telling, they were telling Keith not to go start this church with me because it wasn't going to work out. Like they were discouraging him from going with me because they thought that, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I didn't have what it took to do it or whatever they, they thought. They discouraged him and Cassie both. This was before they had kids. And uh, he said, don't do it. And he still went anyways. Every single week, he drove an hour and a half one way to the city where I lived from the town he lived in to help us plant this church. And he did this one way, hour and a half. And he'd get there early and help me set up in the Texas heat. He would drive from Arkansas to Texas to load up his truck to go and to set up for this church. And guess what happened? The church plant failed. The people, the naysayers, they were right, unfortunately. And we went through some rough patches as a result of some of that stuff. But we're still together today, and our friendship is even stronger than it's ever been because there was something deeper there. There was a deeper connection that spanned beyond, hey, how you doing? There was a deep connection there, a care that we could work through our differences. We could work through struggles. And he still was willing to come and serve in ministry with me, even here, and move 900 miles because there's that, that connection there and that trust, and that friendship, even after we've done things that didn't work out so hot. Even though he could have said, I don't know if this Sheboygan Falls thing is going to work out or not, because I remember something we tried before that didn't work out the way we had hoped it would. But no, he still stuck with me. Let me tell you, you'll have very few of those types of friends in your life. But when you do, you need to cherish them, and you need to keep them close. Amen? Because people will be for you when things are going well in your life. And that's easy. It's easy for somebody to celebrate when people are looking at you and celebrating you. It's easy for people to want to surround you and go, wow, I want to hang out with that guy. Look at how great that guy or that gal is. Look at what they're doing. Look at how successful they are. Look at how good their marriage is. Look at how successful their kids are. Look at how well they're doing it financially. Look at how they're respected by the community. I want to hang out with them. But what about when things aren't going so well? What about when things seem to be falling apart and nothing's going your way? Will those people still stick with you during those times? What if the majority is questioning you and and they don't know if you really have what it takes. And those people still stick with you. That's the type of investment that I'm talking about that will help us to grow and sharpen one another. Amen, somebody? You see, having real friends is an investment that you make and a responsibility that you take. Having real friends is an investment that you make and it's a responsibility that you take. And here's what I'm going to challenge you with today. I can't force you to, to have real connections with people. I can't force you to have real friends. I, that would be weird if I tried to manipulate that here at church. I would never want to do that. I would never want to guilt you or pressure you into doing anything. The only thing that I want our church family to do are the things that God tells us to do and the Holy Spirit convicts us and leads us to do. And I can't make you do any of it. I can't make myself do some of it sometimes. But what I can do as a pastor is I can present opportunities for you to invest, for you to take responsibility, to have real friends, to have real connections. And I want you to use the readily available opportunities that are here at church to get you started making real friends, to get you plugged into making real connections. You know that there's over 190 people that are serving in Team WOG right now, and you know that there is a place for you to get plugged into where there's 190 people that would love to work with you, serve with you, not just because we need people to volunteer at church. Don't think that this is bait and switch on you. This is something where the deeper purpose that spans beyond the fact that you work in the nursery or that you work at guest services or that you help with coffee or things like that, which all those things are greatly appreciated and needed. But the thing that goes deeper than that, that runs deeper than that, that's actually the true benefit of serving with another person is the fact that you are exposed to 
an opportunity to connect with people you would have otherwise not been connected to because you may not have known them. You may not have had the opportunity to be an introduced or to meet or make an investment. But now because of serving together, you're not only investing in making an eternal impact in our church and in our local context here as a word of grace, but you're also investing in getting to know other people and helping our church move forward. We also want to be a church where we have more people. And this is going to be a bold statement, so you need to hang on to your seat. I want us to be a church where we have more people connected relationally in community groups, doing life together, studying scripture together, than attend on a weekend. I love the weekend. It's one of my favorite things that we do. But I, would, I, I, I want people to be connected in relationship beyond the weekend. Yeah, I want you to show up on Sunday. That is extremely important and valuable. But I want you to be connected throughout the week because this is more than just a Sunday thing that we're doing here, folks. I want you to get that. Amen, somebody. I need you to help me preach this morning. Let me know that you're out there because we need to make a deeper connection than just a once a week, hey God, how you doing? So I need people to hold me accountable for that. I need people to encourage me when I start to stray away from that. And if I only see you on Sunday, that's not enough to keep me connected and keep me encouraged. Because I may need to see you on Monday and I need to know you're there for me and we have a friendship and we have a relationship. And so that's why we push Team Walk. That's why we push community groups. Because I want to see people get connected in community groups where they're studying God's Word together and actually applying it to their lives and people are holding them accountable. Yeah, we may start on Sunday getting, getting, uh, uh, using the, the weekend service as a springboard or as a launching pad into the week. But it's not our goal just to come to church once a week. It's our goal to develop our relationship with God. And I need other people that are reminding me and encouraging me and holding me accountable to do that. Amen? We want to be that type of church. And here's the thing. We need to value one another, and we need to value being in community with like-minded people of faith. So if you're not connected and serving, if you're not taking advantage of these opportunities, if you're not connected, what are you waiting for? I want the most valuable, closest relationships that you have to be here in the context of church. Why? Because you share the same faith. You share the same faith. You share the same love for God because you can help one another grow, because you can share a common purpose and common goals. And this should be a natural connection this should be a natural way to connect with other people so we can be used to do greater things for God than any one of us could do alone. That we can uh, allow ministry and serving people with the love of God and showing them the truth of God's word to span beyond an hour or an hour, 15 minutes, once a week to where we can get involved in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities where we can get connected with one another to encourage one another and to serve one another and be there for one another. The problem with modern-day evangelical church is that we have allowed ourselves to become so stinking programmatic that we have programmed relationship out of the equation. Oh, and I'm on my soapbox. We have program relationship out of the equation. When there's a need, we say, oh, we need another program for that. When we see that someone has an issue, we say, oh, we need another program for that. And programs aren't bad in and of themselves, but what we need is not another program. We need another person to care about another person. But for me to care about you, for me to invest in relationship with you, that's going to take some responsibility on me and some responsibility on you. And we've got to allow ourselves to take the time to invest and get connected so I can know where you're at and know what's going on so I can help you grow and help you walk through this journey and you can help me do the same. We've got to get closer. We've got to go deeper. You want to go deeper, let's not talk about weird definitions in Scripture of obscure things. Instead, let's go deeper in our relationship with God and with the people of God. And let's care about one another and show value to one another and invest in this relationship because we have a great thing we've been called to do and we can't do it alone. I'm not that good and neither are you. None of us can do this by ourselves, amen? If we're going to make a, 
an impact on eternity with this gift of life that God has given us, if we're going to do something valuable with our life other than just try to pad our retirement so we can live on easy street and so we can have a nice house and a nice car and take nice vacations and make some nice memories, if we're going to do something that's going to invest and impact eternity, we're going to have to get connected at a deeper level because none of us are sharp enough to do it by ourselves. And God made it that way because he wanted us to be connected. That's why he said iron sharpens iron. That's why he said rejoice with those who rejoice. Bear one another's burdens. That's why he gave us these commands. And we see that when the church is in unity and when we care about one another, we begin to take care of each other. We begin to take care of those in, outside of the church that need to see and feel and experience the genuine love of God, the genuine truth of God, where it's tangible and it's something that's real and not something that's just preached about and written about and read about and spoken about, but it's something that's felt at your workplace. It's something that's felt in your neighborhood. It's something that's felt in this church. And you know that it's real because the people of God have the love of God in their heart. And they have it for one another. And then they have it for their neighbor. And then they have it for their coworker. Amen, somebody. They have it for the waiter or the waitress. They have it. They have that love of God for people over in other countries, whatever the case may be. And we begin to do more for God than we could ever do on our own. You see, Acts 4 and 32 really shows us this. It says this, the congregation of believers was in one heart and soul. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they owned. With great power, the apostles continued to give their testimony about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was on them all. There were no needy ones among them because those who owned lands or houses would sell their property and bring the proceeds from the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet for distribution to anyone as he had need. What? on earth would cause some type of response like this from the people of God to genuinely care for one another to have a real connection to have real relationship to where it's not just about another program to fix a need but it's about the people of God loving each other and meeting them right where they're at where we can move outside of what's comfortable, what's easy, where someone says, you know what, I'm going to take responsibility to invest in connection. I'm going to stop making excuses. I'm going to stop sitting in a chair with my stack of applications to be my friend and wait for people to come. I've been burned before, but I've got to learn to trust again, so I need to invest. I need to allow a new relationship to, for God to use that to help me rebuild trust, to help me to be healed, to make myself available, to take advantage of an opportunity that's in front of me to care about someone and ask questions, to say yes to woodworking and making bowls with an old guy that I never would have met otherwise. To, to say, God, what are you putting in my path that you're wanting me to say yes to today? What have I been saying no to for so long because I've been playing the victim or I've been waiting on other people to come and engage me and it's now time for me to step up and make an investment and take a responsibility to have a real connection, to have real friends, to, to find those people that I'm supposed to walk with or, or maybe even if it's just for a season, even to to have those relationships and have them be healthy. To have those lifelong investments as well. To take that responsibility. To step out. So here's the action step for you today. For all of us. This is what I believe that we should all do. That we should use the opportunities in front of us. To develop deep, sincere friendships that will be real connections. So what opportunities are in front of you right now? How are you going to invest in that connection? How are you going to invest in that connection? How are you going to grow and make sure that that connection continues to grow? God, I thank you for this opportunity to share this word with our church family. 
Help us to invest in relationship first and foremost with you. Help us to secondly invest in our marriages and in our families. And then thirdly, God, help us to also invest in making those friendship connections with other people to where we're allowing ourselves, Father, to be vulnerable again with someone that at some time or another will be a stranger, but who can be that close ahead friend that sticks closer than a brother through the good times and the bad times, through thick and thin, to help us to grow. And that we can also invest in them and pour in them and sharpen them like iron sharpens iron to help them to grow. Help us to learn to be good listeners, to remember people's names, to share care with other people and to not compete with one another except trying to outdo one another in honor and love, loving one another, God, and honoring each other and esteeming each other higher than our own selves. Help us to grow from this day forward and put this word into action. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit wogcc.com.